the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Most loving and affectionate Father, we contemplate the middle mystery, the hidden life of your beloved Son. So often we have to live lives in such a way that the things we do are not seen. Help us to understand that you see all, that to you nothing goes unnoticed. Help us to understand that it is the little things that we do in union with your Son that saves souls and that wins us eternal life. We ask this through the intercession of the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of Divine Mercy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now we center on the middle mystery, the hidden life of Christ. Labor and love after the temple. Obedience and self-abasement, a life before the temple. The temple is the central point. Independence in the service of God. Regardless of what, he follows the Father's will. Mary, Jesus, Joseph. There were many other people around. Three of the greatest people in the world. Yet no one of the, no one around them would have picked them, as I said before. We want an interior knowledge of Jesus, this Jesus, not any imaginary Jesus. For he is with me and I in him. I must have an interior knowledge of him, one illumined by grace. I want to get the message that is intended for me. <clears throat> Every year was the Passover. It was a strict law, for it said, sometimes. And they went every year. There was no question about it. For them, they were strict, according to the law. It was an ordeal. It was 60 miles camping with many others. There were noise, pushing, chatter. The sweet silence of Nazareth was, just didn't exist. Children, 16 adults around a yard, many children. Many things were done in common in Nazareth, in the home of Jesus. Grinding the grain was done in common. They made the dough and then brought it down to the common oven. Sometimes it would bake well if you got a good spot in the oven. And when Mary didn't get a good spot, the bread was a bit doughy. That was community life. At 12, he goes for the exam in education. He knows all the Psalms by heart by now, and he narrates the main stories of the history of the Jews and the law. He's questioned on that. Did he deliberately stay in Jerusalem? Possibly, possibly not. Rather, he was simply waiting his turn. The examiners had to go and perform services, etc., and when they passed, a certain certificate, they were given the right to discuss scripture in their local communities after each service. He was waiting, and they went off without him. What did he do that night? Waited, probably. The next night, what did he do? Who picked him up? This is the second person of the Blessed Trinity. Now, you have to understand, there's a reason why Jesus was left for three days. The tradition was this, that on the feet, high holy days during these exams, the men and women would travel in caravans, and a certain one day's journey before Jerusalem, they would separate, and the women would go in the women's caravan, and the men would go in the men's caravan. And they would enter, and the next day they would go all day, they would travel, and then they would do all of their things in Jerusalem separately. And then they would gather into the caravans again, separate, men and women. And then they would meet back one day's journey into the desert. Now, a child who was going to be examined, any child before examination, had to go with the women's caravan because they couldn't discuss the law. But there was a caveat to the law that once you passed your exams, you had a choice. The last time you could ever return with the women's caravan or you could first time in your life return with the men's caravan. It was the choice of the child who had passed his exams. Now, three days had passed, the days had passed of the, of the high holy days, and uh, Joseph assumed 
that Jesus would want to return for the very last time with his mother in the mother's caravan. Mary assumed that he was going to be going, of course, with the men because he could now finally discuss the law and what magnificent things they could discuss with Jesus. So they each went into their caravans, and one full day's journey, they unite in the desert, and Mary looks at Jesus. Jesus, I mean, Mary looks at Joseph. Joseph looks at Mary. They look behind each other. Where's Jesus? He says, oh, I thought he was with you. She says, I thought he was with you. There they go. A second day. You know, because really when you think of it, if you were the mother of the Son of God, would you lose him? There had to be a reason. And this is the only reason. Now, Joseph, probably the rightful heir to the throne of David, had a lot of relatives in Jerusalem. So here he goes, him and Mary. That, that, now, this is two days. Now they spend the entire third day going from one relative's house to the another, trying to find Jesus. And at the end of the third day, they finally decide just going into the temple. And there Jesus is, wowing all of the scribes and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Now, it's interesting, because there is a law that says before the leaders before the examiners, before the scribes and the Pharisees, no woman could ever speak, even to this day. When you go into a Jewish temple, there's a separate space for the women and a separate place for the men. The men stay up on top, the women stay up on top, where they look down on what's going on, and the men stay on the bottom, but they do not mix unless you're in a reformed temple. Now, it's interesting, because Mary speaks. Mary says, son, why have you done this to you? Why have you done this? Your father and I have been worried. What beautiful light this puts Joseph in when you think of it. Now here Joseph's not speaking. Why? Because it wasn't his son. And it said in the apocryphal books, written way before Jesus, it said that only the virgin mother could speak before the elders. And here you have Mary, the virgin mother, speaking. Now, he says, what does that have to do with you and me? Don't you know that I must be about my father's business? First of all, you and me. It was something that was dealing with both of them there as well. And don't you know I must be about my father's business? Immediately, all of the people in there thought, what does he mean? Carpentry? We don't have him building anything. We don't have a roof repaired. What do you mean about his father's business? So he was, went home and was subject to them. Remember, Mary can have absolutely no fault whatsoever. They marveled at what he said. Scripture scholars are dumb. Or they think that Jesus only had enough knowledge. But here he really floors the teachers stupefied at his intelligence and what he knew. Now, can you imagine, I wonder, you know, I, I wish I would have, I, you know, it would be wonderful to be there because you can imagine, how would Jesus, in a gentle, subtle way, tell someone that they don't know what they're talking about? You know, you, I just wish I would have been there because, you know, you do know that they, many of them didn't know what they were talking about. They were talking through a hole in their head. And Jesus, in a very gentle way, would speak to them to the point where they were listening and they understood. Remember, Mary can have no fault. She has no stain of sin, no fault at all. We were sorrowing, she says, your father and I. There's no fault here. There's no rebuke. And he says, did you not know? He was impatient and waiting for the father's will burning with zeal all these years. Who didn't understand the word they spoke unto him? It was the audience. Mary and Joseph certainly knew. They understood much, much more than any of the scribes or the teachers did. Eventually, when Jesus does leave Mary, she wasn't alone. Her sisters and so forth were there. He had a big family, Jesus. This specific event gives some idea 
of the obedience of Jesus. You see this kind of obedience this isn't just blind. Rather, it's an encounter with the will of another. And he submits freely to that will because of love. And now, this is an interesting thing, really, when you think of it. Jesus and Mary, okay? Utter transcendence, utter transcendence, yet genuine human experience. How? How is that possible? That Jesus is God, there are no exceptions whatsoever. That Jesus is man in all things except sin, how? How is that possible? got to take them both. You can't take one without the other. I've told you that. Jesus, on the one hand, is the second person of the Blessed Trinity. On the other, a genuine human experience. Mary, total human experience. Baking bread, coloring the wool, bathing the baby, nursing the baby. At the same time, the woman of all ages, filled with grace, full of grace. The life that we are looking at is a total, genuine experience, human experience with no exceptions, except sin. We have to work hard at both. He suffered from ignorance, yet knows all things. How? As they say in Italian, but. I don't know. Sometimes it seems like a contradiction. But that doesn't bother me, for we transcend the power of the mind to grasp. Jesus prayed to know God's will, but he was God. How could he know all and yet seek to know? I believe it was so. He was God. He had incomprehensible capacity to know and not know at the same time. I know. I know. It sounds almost bizarre. If you studied philosophy, it would really make sense. It shows you what philosophy <laughs> does to you. When the scholastics explain it, the worst thing is that you think you understand it. If you think you understand it, you're an idiot. You just can't. You just can't understand it completely. There's just no way you can do it. Pray for the humility of faith. Humility of intellect. It is consoling to know that my Jesus went through the same process as I do, memorizing and so forth. He was enduring the human lot prepared for him by the Father. He never changed the rocks to bread, you know, even though he could have very easily. He never used his divine knowledge, though he was tempted. You know he was tempted. Temptation was always there. When I say the Psalms, I say the exact same Psalm prayers that Jesus did. What did he ponder, I wonder, each year a different Psalm will hit you? What did Jesus think? Every time you read your psalms and something really hits you, put a dot there. If it's repeated, Jesus is telling you something. Now, they were very hospitable, Jesus and Mary and Joseph. You remember the parable of the man in the night who seeks bread, who needs bread because a buddy of his came into town? Probably came from his own experience. Probably remembers Joe getting up in the middle of the night. All right, all right, stop banging on the stinking door. I'm coming. There were sticky children because there was sticky candy. So Jesus, I'm sure, was covered with goo every now and then. And Mary would have to take him and wash his sticky hands because that, it made all their candy out of honey and crud like that. Jesus consecrated the social virtues. Every one of them he consecrated.
Jesus dancing at a wedding? You better believe it. If you didn't dance at a wedding, you were a stick in the mud. People wouldn't like you very much. But it wasn't so much that. It was that was joyful. Everybody danced at a wedding, and Jesus most certainly did. He knew the social virtues. He told Simon all that he muffed. Now, how to apply this to myself? I see that. And this is really a neat thought. When I first heard it, I just I had to write it down because it's just analogy, analogy here. Listen to this. As Jesus is to the hypostatic union, remember, that's that union inseparable between man and God, so am I to the divine indwelling, this union between God, the Trinity, and me with regard to the hidden life by analogy. Very beautiful thought. You can spend a couple years, so just write it down. I am Jesus to the world. At the same time, I am utterly me, especially if I'm a priest. From 12 years old to 30, 18 years, that's the message. 18 years. The marvelous part is that he did it and nobody thought he was anything. Excellent taste to handle his environment. How did Mary handle the things at the well? The gossip, the dirty stories, and if you don't think women can tell dirty stories, you haven't been to the well. I have been. <laughs> How did she get rid of a salesman? Think about it. Mary had to put up with this stuff. There were salesmen, door-to-door -door salesmen, constantly in Jerusalem. Transcendence, yet hold on to the other, always. We don't realize, really, the faith of Mary and Joseph as I told you before, Mary had one vision, Joe, three dreams, and that's it. Elizabeth, blessed art thou who hast believed. We transcend. It is the commonplace in our own lives that must transcend everything. We must lay the basics for discernment of spirits. We must have a good, solid mental hygiene for true discernment. We don't have a question of the devil when all we need is a bit of Alka-Seltzer. Emotions and feelings, they're different. An emotion and feeling could either be true or false. If it is a true emotion or feeling, I follow it. If it's false, I don't. Now, the first thing I do, and here... I perceive the situation. The second thing, I perceive the meaning of that situation to me, danger, joy, or pleasure. And then I have a bodily reaction, and two things happen when I have a bodily reaction. First, there's tension, an automatic to deliberate, from automatic to that deliberate. If I walk on a floor that's seven-inch tiles, there's no problem. But if I'm 700 feet up in the air and I've got a seven-foot, seven-inch beam, Better believe there's a problem. Have you ever done that? I worked in construction, and you can walk and tell you there's seven inch tiles or whatever here. You can walk a straight line perfectly, but you put that seven inches up 600 feet, it ain't gonna happen. Then there's a sympathetic system that goes out. The heart begins to beat enough to get the blood going. And if it's warm, my sympathetic system causes me to sweat, perspire. Then the endocrine glands start pouring into me in the center of my brain. A pineal gland is the director putting a complicated chemical of fear, a certain proportion, courage and joy, another poor proportion. Whatever it is, it comes through the thyroid in the neck and shoots dioxin in my bloodstream. It's like fire, lighter fluid on a fire. Then the pineal fluid goes to the pancreas where the adrenal glands start looking for the adrenaline, the fuel. 
goes through the body and takes the stored sugar to burn up. Then it goes to the deputox, shooting insulin into my system, balancing the thioxin and the sugar. Therefore, a person is a hyperthyroid if he burns up everything. And if it's an inactive thyroid, he gets fat because he doesn't burn it up. It goes then to the gonads that shoot gonadine into my system, giving the sex reaction. The male sex reaction is, is violent. The female is passive. The male fights. The female faints because of the gonadine in them. All this stuff is shooting around in my system. And that is a feeling. Everything I just said is a feeling. That's what you feel. All that mess inside is a feeling. If I use it up, I feel all right. If I'm angry and I keep a lot of it inside, and I don't go and release it and use it up, I just fret and fret and fret. That's an emotion. If what's out there is truth, I check it against reality. Where is that? Yeah, here it is. If I perceive, I check it against reality, okay? Then I perceive the meaning to it to me, and I check it against truth. Is this real? I feel something. I check it against a whole bunch of stuff. Diet, fatigue, glands, reflexes, cycle, weather, health. I remember there was a guy in the seminary. And he came up to me and he said, Father, I'm leaving. He had all his bags packed. He's in Italy. He just decided he's going to leave. And I looked at him and I said, why? This is not my vocation. Father, I've got such anxiety. I can't stand it. I've got to get out of here. This is not my call. I said, well, he said, I'll, I'll tell you what. Look at me. You got, give me three days. Just three days. He says, well, I'm not going to unpack. I said, you can sleep in your suitcase. I don't care. Just give me three days. So he says, all right. So I watched him. And this was at breakfast time. I watched him snack. Then I watched him eat lunch. I watched him snack in the afternoon. I watched him eat dinner. I watched him snack before I went to bed. And I watched him eat breakfast. So I came over and I tapped him on the shoulder and I said, excuse me, my dear brother, Come and see me in my office, would you please? Because I think I understand your problem. So he comes up to the room and he says, all right, I don't have a vocation, right? And he says, whether you have a vocation is not for me to tell you yes or no. But I says, I do know your problem. He says, well, what is it? He said, you eat too much cheese. He says, I'm going home. And you're telling me my I eat too much cheese? Are you nuts? I said, no, I'm not nuts. I said, I watched you. You are snarfing down cheese like nobody I've ever seen. You ate cheese in the morning, cheese in the mid-morning, cheese at lunch, cheese in the afternoon, cheese at dinner, and then you eat breakfast, you had cheese and bread. I said, have you ever heard the term cheesy feeling? He says, yeah, why? What does that have to do with anything? I said, it's the exact same feeling as anxiety. You stop eating the cheese and you'll be fine. <laughs> and, he, and he looked at me and he says, get out of here. I said, no, I got two days. I forbid you to eat any cheese. I said, if you want me to help you, just stop eating the cheese. So he did. He was ordained. He works at the Vatican in the Latin department. He never left. We have to check the diet. Now, we also have to check perception. I'll tell you a story about a nun, a cloistered nun. She came, uh, mother called me and says, oh, Sister Mary of the Angels is going nuts. And I said, really, what's going on? Well, she, she, I don't know. She just wants to see you. I said, okay, all right. So I went to the, the grill, and, and there she was in the parlor, and and I says, hello, sister, how are you? She says, I don't know, Father, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do. I said, what's wrong, what's wrong? You're in a cloister, how could that be that bad? She says, well, sister, sister Mary Magdalene, she, can't, she hates me. I said, Get out, sister, come on. You're in a cloister, how could she possibly? She says, I know she does, I know she does. She says, you know, Father, for the past week, 
a little bit more than a week. She said, I haven't been able to sit next to her. When she's walking down the hallway, I put my head down. I kind of walk away. I can't be with her during recreation because she, she, she's, she's got something. She's angry at me or something. I said, okay, 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 back up the truck over here. Okay. Now tell me, where do you get this idea? She says, well, I'll tell you exactly what happened, Father. Sister Mary Magdalene's room is at the end of the corridor, and immediately to the left of her door is the chapel. And I was coming down the, the, the hallway, and Sister, Sister Mary Magdalene opens the door. She looks at me. She stamped her foot. She turned around and slammed the door in my face. I said, well, that doesn't sound like Sister Mary Magdalene. Yes, Father, but you could see why I'm so upset. I, I said, why didn't you talk to her? I don't, I'm afraid to. I don't know what I did. What's right? She's mad at me. I said, well, what do you want me to do about it? She says, well, talk to her. Could you please talk to her? I said, okay, okay. So I went to Mother Spirit. Can I speak to Sister Mary Magdalene? She says, sure. Sister Mary Magdalene comes in. Sister's gone. Sister Mary of the Angels is gone. Mary Magdalene comes in and she says, hello, Father, with a glorious day. I said, yes, I know. It's magnificent. Is everything going okay? Well, cloistered none. Why wouldn't it be? Everything is wonderful. I said, well, I mean, are, everything, everything is going smoothly with every individual in here? She says, oh, yeah. She says, well, Sister Mary of the Angels acting a little squirrely lately, but, eh, that's her, you know. And I said, that's the one I want to talk to you about. She says, why? What's wrong? She says, well, she says that you're angry with her. Why would I be angry? I don't understand, Father. That's, that's not true. I, could, I can't. I'm not. I have nothing. There's nothing that happened. She says, well, yeah, she said you did something. She says, what, what did I do? I said, she said that she was walking down the corridor, and you came out of your room, you looked right at her, you stomped your foot, you turned around, and you slammed the door in her face. She says, Father, that never... Wait a second. Was that a little over a week ago? I said, yeah, that's exactly it. She said, that wasn't what it was at all. I said, well, what was it? She said, the day before was my birthday. And my little nieces and nephews came over, and they gave me the most hideous bunny slippers I've ever seen in my life. They had these big, gigantic, floppy ears and eyeballs that rolled around, and the tail would go up and down every time I walked. She said, and I, I immediately took them to Mother Superior, and I said, Mother, please give these to someone else. And Mother looked at me and said, No, I think they're cute. You wear them from now on. Just, oh, really? Just, go ahead. Just, just wear them. Try them out. So, in obedience, she was, she's obedient. Mother suggested that she do it for, for humility, wearing them around her apartment or her cell. So she got ready that next morning, and she was getting everything ready and opened the window to let some fresh air in the cell. And, and she had her bunny slippers, on, you know, that the mother told her to wear. And then she opened the door, and she's ready to go to the chapel because the bell rang. She stopped and she thought, the bunny slippers. And she felt them on her feet. And she says, I felt that I still had them on. And I turned around as fast as I could. And because I had opened my window, the wind caught the door and slammed it shut. She says, do you know what would happen, Father? Oh, sorry about that. I got a quick bit on here. She said, do you know what would happen, Father, if I showed up in chapel with bunny slippers? They would be talking about it 150 years from now. I said, oh, I can understand that. Now, you see, if Sister Mary of the Angels would have just asked her, there would have been no problem whatsoever. She didn't check her perception against reality. How many people get into arguments? Couples, when they're married, they just don't perceive reality, and so they're constantly arguing. And I have to stop and say, whoa, 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 back up. Look at what's going on. Check your perception against reality. I did the same thing happen to me. I was working in a hospital in, in, in Canada, a very, very difficult place to work because of social medicine. Is, I just had to watch so many people die from needlessly. And... I came home, I, you know, they had me working like two weeks, and then I had four days off, and then I worked two weeks. And we were at a retreat house across the St. Lawrence Seaway, the Fleuve saint -Oran. And I came home, and one of my brothers, the priest brothers, was there. It was a retreat center, and they had a beautiful property, and it was like fall. And I walked in, and I looked at him, and I says, oh, my dear brother, 
I said, tell me, have you been outside? Take a walk. Have you, have you looked at the color of the leaves? Have you, and he looked at me. And he went, and he stormed out of the room. And I thought, that's the strangest diarrhea I've ever seen in my life. Must have diarrhea. Why would he run? So I, I waited and waited. He never came back. So I thought, oh, well, maybe he's, you know, he's sitting there for a while. I don't know. So then I, I went to dinner. He came, I came by dinner. And I sat next to him, and he picked up his plate, and he moved to the other side of the table. And I thought, So then I have a, I'm home for three days, four days. And every time I tried to talk to him, I knock on his door. I'm busy. So I said, okay. So I went back to work for two weeks, wondering what is going on with this guy. So then I came back four more days, wouldn't talk to me, wouldn't talk to me. I went back to the hospital. I'm thinking, this has got to stop. I don't know why. He's my, one of my best friends. So I went there, and the next week when I came by, he was in his room when I got home. And I knocked on the door, and he says, who's there? I didn't say anything. I figured he'd have to open the door. Knocked on the door again. Who's there? Knocked on the door again. Came and knocked on the door, and I put my foot in the door because he's going to close it. And he said, all right, we're going to get this over with now. What is wrong with you? It's not me, it's you. I said, well, what did I do? You know that I love you. You're my brother. I would never do anything to deliberately hurt you. Oh, you know what you did. I said, what, am I married now? <laughs> no offense. I said, what do you mean what you know I did? You know exactly what you did. You come here, and when you're working and you're spend, you're making all this money and supporting this whole retreat house, which I had no idea that I was doing. I didn't know how much they gave me. It went straight to my superior. And he says, and you come here, and you insinuate that all we do is walk around and look at the leaves and smell the flowers. I said, What? For over a month, you've put me through hell because of that? I said, did it ever dawn on you that all I see is death all day? And I just wanted to hear anything but hospital talk. I didn't care if you recited the ABCs to me. Oh, really? I said, yeah, dupa. Dupa, you know what that is? Polish. My mother, by the way, used to call me her little pupka. And I thought, what is that, Mom? And I was a little kid. Just, that means you're my little dolly. I said, Pupka is dolly? Yeah, I'm asking you my little dolly. And so she said, every now and then she says, oh, you're my little Pupka. So I've been telling people all my life, you know, oh, yeah, my mother's little nickname for me was kind of weird. It was called P little Pupka. And here I am, a priest for years, you know, working at the Vatican, working all over the world. And I'm giving a talk. And I said, yeah, yeah, my mother had a little nickname because I, I come from a Polish background, Polish, German, Russian, Irish, and Hebrew. And kind of a meshkalanza, you know. And uh, I said, yeah, she's called me a little poop guy. And I, this woman raised her hand. She says, Father, excuse me, but she says, I'm from Poland. And that does not mean little dolly. I says, really? I says, what does it mean? She says, your mother was calling you a pant load. <laughs> you know, I should have figured anything sounds like poop guy. But all my life, I was like in my 40s when I finally figured it out. God bless my mother. Anyway. So you got to check the perception against reality. That's the most important thing. And that is really one of the most powerful elements of discernment of spirits, especially in dealing with other people. We need to do that. The situation, what is it, and then the reaction, and figure out what it is. Maybe you just have to change change something. I remember there was another time I was, um, oh, what was it? I was in Brazil, and this guy comes up to me, and he says, Father, I need an exorcism on my barn. And I says, your barn? And he says, yes, Father. He says, I've got a brand new pole barn, and every single horse that I put in there dies it's probably possessed. Father, you've got to come in and you've got to exercise that barn. I can't afford to lose any more horses. So I went over there and I said, well, before we talk about the devil, let's just take a look at the barn. And it's a beautiful barn. And I was looking at him and I said, when did the horses start dying? He says, right after we built the barn. We built this barn and then the horses started dying. He says, yes. I said, where was the barn before? He says, down that hill a little bit ways, about, about a quarter of a block down there. 
I said, take this barn and move it back there, and the horses will stop dying. He says, why do you say that? I said, because I remember reading in a Reader's Digest that a man who owned horses, they were dying, and they discovered that the water table had risen so far and so up close to the level of the ground that the horses were absorbing the moisture and dying of pneumonia. He moved the barn, and as he was pulling out the poles, water shot up through the ground. And it was just water, not the devil. You know, I mean, we really have to be careful. You know, the, 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 the church says you've got to eliminate every single thing possible before you start blaming the devil. Because most of the time it's diet, it's psychological. I know one woman who was, she was convinced, her husband, her children were convinced that she was possessed. And I looked at her, I talked to her, and I watched her over a period of 45 minutes go up and down so many times I needed Dramamine. I mean, up high and then low and high. And, low. and I says, you know something, excuse me, but I'm not a psychiatrist or anything, but you better see one because you, it looks like to me you have a chemical imbalance. There's something wrong. There's a physical problem, sure enough. And she was a nurse. She went to get to see a psychiatrist. It was, it was a doctor, doctor. And sure enough, she had a chemical imbalance. Here she thought she was possessed. She couldn't pray. She hated mass. She hated her family. She was ready to divorce because she thought she was possessed. And so did her husband and her kids. And after she started taking the medicine, she was perfectly fine. You know, I mean, we really have to look and see. We have to really discern. And this is all part of the sermon of spirits. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Most loving and affectionate Father, you have given us so much knowledge, so much to contemplate. Grant us peace of heart, peace of soul, peace of mind, so that we may think of your great wondrous gifts and apply them to our lives and to the world. Grant us humility of intellect so that we may never look at what we see as being always the truth and always what it is. Open our minds and hearts to the possibility so that we may truly judge rightly. We ask this through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the mother of the Lord, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.